Uh, 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 not yet. This, this oh, it's arriving. Good, the good one? Yes. Um, so uh, we are at session uh, 22. Uh, wastewater and uh, sewer sludge handling the last link uh, in the in the chain. Um, don't forget that this afternoon uh, of a training um, interreg, uh, wastewater control and uh, seawater quality. Uh, uh, is it possible to do uh, uh, and act differently? Uh, so uh, that's the program for uh, today. Uh, I will maybe stop uh, stop sharing and uh, we can go to our session. So slide uh, 30, uh, just to uh, show you the, the program of today. Um, we are at the opening of, uh, of this session on uh, wastewater and sewer sludge. Um, I'm uh, Piotr Wojda uh, chairing this session together with my colleague uh, Yusi. Uh, and uh, you will see a series of presentation. Um, we are not sure if all the presenters are here. so. Um, uh, the program might be uh, slightly uh, modified uh, in uh, the meantime. Uh, so welcome to um, all the um, participants. Uh, we are uh, already 16 in the room. Maybe I will wait uh, one minute more um, and uh, we can kick off um, the, uh, the session. So it's already the last day of the presentation. I think that um, in the meantime, I jumped into the uh, sustainability session, uh, which uh, started already uh, many hours ago. Uh, so I participated in a, a couple of uh, interesting discussion on um, sustainable development goals. Uh, so uh, it's still ongoing in, in parallel. Uh, so uh, it was a, it is still a great event uh, of 24 hours uh, continuing around the, the globe. Uh, so um, we had different chairs and uh, trying to uh, animate the discussion uh, all over the globe 24 hours. Uh, so an interesting uh, experience. <laughs> So um, okay, I think that we can uh, we can officially uh, start the the session. Uh, welcome uh, to um, the speakers. Welcome to the uh, audience. I'm Piotr Wojda. I work uh, for the European Commission Joint Research Center. Uh, Joint Research Center is a um, policy uh, support um, uh, directorate general of the European Commission, uh, providing. Uh, science and research and um, evidence uh, in the policy making process. Um, so um, we um, are located in different places of uh, Europe. Uh, I work uh, in Italy uh, and uh, I work for the land resources unit uh, dealing with uh, soil, uh, soil contamination, uh, soil health, uh, and also dealing with uh, some problems connected to water. Uh, it is um, uh, runoff uh, problems and uh, soil erosion problems and also um, chemical and biological processes that um, are in the soil part and of course um, uh, le uh, leaching to the groundwaters. Uh, so I'm very interested in this session uh, just to know also uh, different, uh, different methodologies on how to treat wastewater. Uh, and how to dispose sewer sludge, for example. This is one of our projects as well uh, here at the JRC. Uh, and um, maybe I will leave the floor to UC, to uh, my other co-chair of the session, uh, to present uh, himself and uh, to introduce uh, the first uh, speaker. UC, the floor is yours. Thank you, <clears throat> Piotr. Yes, my name is Jus Renikan and I come from the Finnish Environment Institute. It's a uh, part of our Finnish uh, National um, Environmental Administration. So I'm mainly working with contaminated uh, land management. Uh, risk assessment is probably my, uh, in my co core competence and also sustainable remediation. And those are the kind of like the overall topics that I I'm mostly involved in. I have to say here that I'm not that much dealing with the uh, waste uh, water issues, but of course today I'm happy to learn um, more. So uh, the first um, 
speaker of, of the session will be Constanza Pallicerotto. I hope I pronounced that even <laughs> uh, <laughs> almost correctly. Um, and he'll, she'll be tell, telling us about uh, microalgae and how they remove nitrogen, phosphorus, and Eserichia coli load from urban wastewater streams. Uh, Constanza is a researcher at the University of Ferrara. Her expertise area is in plant biology and biotechnical logical application of microalgae for phytoremediation processes of wastewater and as sources of active molecules for food, feed, and cosmetics. She's currently involved in the Value CEEM project, which includes collaboration with various research institutions and private companies in the Emilia Romagna region, Italy. So please, Constanza, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm trying to share my presentation. Can you see it? Yes, yes it's full screen. Okay. Yes, it's a full screen. Perfect. So, uh, good morning, everyone. This presentation, so microalgae remove nitrogen, phosphorus, and also Escherichia coli load from the urban wastewater streams, is a, a, a collaborative research among the University of Ferrara, Terra Tech, and the Gruppo ERA, Holding Energia and Ambiente, which manages the wastewater treatment plant here in Ferrara. This project is part of a larger one, a European project for FESR, uh, named the Value Chain, as uh, Piotr <laughs> said before. Well, as already known, uh, human activities, both industrial, domestic, or uh, agricultural ones, produce a wide variety of wastewater. But main problems are associated with the release of not efficiently treated wastewaters into natural surface water bodies. And these are uh, eutrophication due to nutrients, so nitrogen and phosphorus mainly, input of metals or other chemical pollutants, but also of bacteria or other potentially harmful microorganisms. So uh, wastewaters need to be treated before their disposal in the natural environment. In this within this uh, perspective, the wastewater depuration plant of Ferrara is, uh, treats both civil and industrial wastewater. It is a traditional plant characterized by a water line depuration followed by a sludge line depuration. The first, uh, the first three steps of this uh, sludge line uh, produce wastewater still enriched in nitrogen and phosphorus, so nutrients, but also bacteria, uh, especially Escherichia coli, which is uh, an harmful bacterium. So these waters are recirculated inside the uh, wastewater treatment plants to be uh, depurated themselves. And it is the streams deriving from the thickening step, as we can see here, that we used for present research. Well, as uh, widely known, reported in the literature, uh, wastewater depuration can take uh, advantages uh, and support from uh, microalgae phytoremediation. Microalgae, in fact, are uh, eukaryotic photosynthetic microorganisms with an enormous biodiversity. They are really uh, adaptable to environmental variations and conditions uh, and are characterized by high growth rates and biomass productivities. When they are cultivated, in the presence of wastewaters, uh, they can uh, um, purify the wastewater, but at the same time produce also biomass, which can be valorized, for example, as uh, and, uh, you, uh, this biomass can be used as biofertilizer, but also as feed or as a green energy source, as uh, we can see in this uh, schematic value chain representation. Well, within our uh, value chain project, the European project, we already isolated the several microalgal strains. And in the papers reported alongside, we, use, we used the monoculture of microalgal isolate. While in this uh, uh, presentation, uh, we focused our attention on uh, two points. Uh, we, we focused on consortia instead of microalgia monocultures, because uh, with respect to monoculture, uh, of uh, algae. Uh, consortia are faster to be isolated, uh, they are easier to be maintained in the culture, 
and uh, they can uh, um, respond, they, uh, they, are, uh, they are characterized by a higher stability against environmental stresses. Since uh, as one species uh, succumbs to environmental variations, another, another one can prevail, thus, deter thus um, determining a, a kind of uh, uh, dynamism inside the whole population. And this is very important considering that the wastewaters in the um, wastewater treatment plants uh, can vary a lot during the year. The second point we, is, we focused on is uh, linked to Escherichia coli load. Uh, Escherichia coli is an harmful biological agent needing tertiary treatments before, uh, like chlorination before uh, a safe disposal of the treated wastewater. Well, as already mentioned, we used the streams deriving from the thickening steps, a step of the wastewater treatment plant of Ferrara. It was still enriched in suspended solids, so we needed to filtrate it. But uh, filtration did not alter so much the chemical composition, especially in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus content. We isolated microalgae and, uh, and, and studied them uh, in, lab flask, in laboratory flasks uh, tests to evaluate the nitrogen and phosphorus uh, abatement in the medium, but also growth of algae cultivated both in the medium and in a synthetic medium modified according to nutrient, nitrogen and phosphorus content in the wastewater as a control. In parallel, we analyzed also wastewater samples without algae. This to ensure that uh, no stripping processes or precipitation were occurring. The um, experimentation uh, was a, a 14 days long experiment. As regards the results, we obtained several uh, microalgal strains, isolates, but we used the, uh, the consortium, which was formed by mainly three algal species. Uh, the, the most abundant one was chlorella-like algae. Then we had the Shinedesmus-like uh, elongated algae. The, the, these algae were ascribable to this genus and uh, some chlamydomonas-like flagellate algae. Uh, as regards the growth, so the first, up, uh, th the first uh, um, result we obtained, it was evident that the growth was uh, uh, important only in treated samples. As we can see by cell density, uh, the, the kinetic cures as a cell density, as dry biomass uh, evaluation and the daily productivity. In uh, orange, in fact, uh, we can, you can see the uh, treated samples, so algae cultivated in the presence of the effluent. We uh, wanted to uh, check uh, each, uh, the, the cell density of each algal cells, and we observed that uh, Shinedesmus-like algae uh, can, grew, can grow all the, for all the time in the effluent, while in control condition, it, uh, this algae did not grow so much. While chlorella-like cells uh, grew for all the uh, period in control condition, so in the synthetic medium, why, and grow, uh, grew a lot uh, during the first seven, 10 days of, of cultivation in the effluent, then entering the stationary phase. The flagellate cells did not grow uh, at all. The same data reported as cell percentage distribution uh, let us uh, to know, to, to see that there was a tendency to a more heterogeneous, uh, homogeneous, sorry, distribution of uh, alga, algae in the consortium in wastewater uh, samples. In fact, in the uh, synthetic medium, uh, algae were characterized by a tendency to um, chlorella-like cells in green tended to prevail over the cells, uh, the Shinedesmus-like cells, so that represented here as a, um, as a blue histogram. While in treated samples, the cell distribution was uh, almost uh, um, similar during all the experiment, experiment time. This suggests us that both algae, uh, so chlorella and the Shinedesmus-like algae, equally uh, appreciated the effluent, the thickening effluent. 
As regards nutrients removal, so one of the main topics of our research, we, um, we observed that the flasks containing the effluent with uh, the algae in orange or without the algae in gray um, can uh, lead to a an important uh, reduction of the uh, nitrogen content as ammonium. In fact, the, re the removal efficiency was about 62 or 84 uh, percent in samples with or without the algae. This was parallel to um, an increase of nitrate, so nitrogen in the form of nitrate, in, uh, in especially in the samples without algae, so in gray. Thus indicating that uh, in the effluent, there was uh, an active uh, nitrifying bacteria um, component, which was, however, counteracted by the presence of microalgae, which, mant which uh, maintained at a lower concentration the nitrogen content in the, in the effluent, in the medium. As regard, sorry, I don't know why. Non va più avanti, it doesn't. Okay, as regard phosphate, uh, we observed that uh, uh, phosphate remo removal was observed only in samples, uh, in treated samples, so in flasks containing algae and the effluent. The removal efficiency was about 78% only in these samples. So the presence of microalgae uh, for sure uh, promoted the uh, phosphorus removal. Summarizing this uh, part one of, the, of our research, we can say that the isolated consortium was very efficient, both in terms of growth in the thickening effluent and in terms of promoting the nutrient abutment. Furthermore, results let open the idea that the algae had a role sometime, somehow in uh, containing bacteria activity or load, or, or load. Thus, in the second part of this research, we focused our attention also to the bacteria, the microbiological uh, components. Again, we used the same effluent, which needed to be filtered. And uh, again, uh, the uh, chemical composition was not altered so much, while Escherichia coli load was uh, um, evidently removed. But uh, even if the um, uh, Escherichia coli content also in the, filtered, uh, uh, in, the, in the filtered stream was uh, still very high, 17,000 unit forming colony per uh, 100 milliliters. There is some problem. Okay. In this case, we um, cultivated the algae. In this case, a monoculture, a, prom a promising monoculture, we, uh, we isolated in a 20 liter capacity uh, and aerated uh, small uh, vessel. Uh, here we tested the nitrogen and phosphorus abatement in the wastewater, but also the growth and morphology of algae uh, together to with the evaluation of uh, Escherichia coli load abatement. Ah. Okay, sorry, sometimes the slide doesn't uh, work. Uh, as regards uh, growth, in this case, uh, we observed uh, that uh, microalgae formed uh, um, a, a clear, a clear aggregates uh, on the bottom of the vessel, as uh, we can see in these uh, uh, images. So we could uh, estimate uh, algal growth only as uh, optical density and dry biomass, dry biomass. However, we observed that the most growth of algae uh, occurred during the first four, seven days of cultivation in the wastewater. Uh, as uh, we could expect, uh, nitrogen, uh, uh, mm, we observe a partial nitrification of ammonium into nitrate as for part one of the experiment, but the total reduction of nitrogen, uh, of total nitrogen reduction was estimated to be about 70, uh, 65, 70%. As regards phosphate, the reduction was uh, uh, really important 70% only in four days of cultivation. But what about uh, Escherichia coli? Escherichia coli load was uh, completely uh, uh, removed 
only in 14 days of cultivation. In fact, at time zero, we observed that we, the, the, the Surnakans contained 17,000 unit forming colony per 100 milliliter, while at the end of the experiment, only four. This was linked to the formation, as we already mentioned, of cell aggregates between the algae and bacteria. Um, thanks to the release uh, of esopolysaccharides by the, uh, the, the algal components, uh, as we can see here after algae blue staining. Uh, it is important to highlight also that the precipitation of algae bacteria agglomerate let uh, obtain a sort of uh, very clean water column, uh, transparent water column above the uh, cell aggregates on the bottom of the vessel. So uh, the cultivation uh, led to obtain that, um, that to um, showed us that the nutrients and the Scherichia coli load abutment were accompanied by a promising natural decantation of algae and also bacteria, but also suspended solids. And this is very important considering that in a real, in concrete uh, biotechnological application exploitation of microalgae, the uh, separation of algae from the medium is a, a remains a strange and uh, expensive issue. What we are doing now is, the, uh, is to test the ability of algae to grow and remove nutrients and the Scherichia coli in a 800 liters capacity prototype set at the era plant. And here you can see the isolated microalgae culture and the thickening wastewater. Uh, again, we observe that algae um, let produce uh, agglomerates on the bottom of the, the, of the prototype, thus uh, uh, indicating that the cultivation uh, could, could be very promising also uh, after a, a large um, scale up of the process, of the cultivation process. In conclusion, we can say that uh, our isolated microalgae, both uh, as natural consortia and as a monoculture, could uh, remove nutrients from the thickening wastewater streams. And also we can say that the isolated microalgae promoted the almost complete Scherichia coli load abutment from the effluent, thus, thus uh, making it possible to reduce the employment of uh, uh, sodium uh, hypochlorite in the tertiary treatments. And clearly this is uh, very important uh, considering uh, to improve the management and efficiency of uh, wastewater treatment plants. I thank you for your attention. This is our contact. And uh, if you want to, uh, to check uh, in better our project value chain, you can see the uh, website here reported. Thank you very much, uh, Costanza, for uh, this, uh, this okay. presentation and presenting um, new methods improving um, uh, the current uh, standards. Uh, so it, it was very interesting. Thank you for this. Um, we'll collect the questions and um, through the chat and ask uh, the questions uh, to the speakers um, at the end uh, of the presentation cycle. So it will be uh, around 1.20 uh, European time. Uh, so um, thank you very much. Uh, we can go uh, to the next um, speaker. Um, the next speaker uh, will be Signor uh, Rossini. Uh, chemical engineer um, and uh, technical manager in any uh, rewind. Uh, he deals with uh, wastewater, groundwater, and uh, produced water treatment uh, plants, remediation projects uh, involving plant decommissioning um, with removal, treatment, and disposal of uh, sludges. Um, so, uh, Mr. Uh, Rossini will uh, present the Blue Water uh, project. Uh, so, please, the floor is yours. Thank you for your presentation. Good morning, everyone. I started the presentation, sorry. I hope it's okay. It's not yet full screen. 
Okay. Yes, it's now full screen. Yes. Thank you. Uh, morning, I'm Mario Rossini. I'll talk, I'm going to talk about blue water technology. Blue water technology is uh, the technology made in any. Uh, this is the, the conventional term of the uh, research and development project we developed in the last 10 years um, as any rewind for ENI to treat the produced water the water associated with the destruction of hydrocarbons. Just a short introduction about the contest, about the uh, produced water and what, what the produced water are. Uh, hydrocarbons in uh, deep geological formation uh, in uh, reservoirs, so-called, are associated with the formation water. Formation water are the water which are joined with the hydrocarbon in the deep formation. Uh, the term produced water in, is uh, used to define that water that stay on the ground at surface uh, when we separate this water from the hydrocarbons. Um, the context of this water is different from the chemical um, profile to the uh, microbiological profile, because in the deep formation, there is no oxygen and uh, it is a different profile. So um, talking about the uh, produced water uh, during the um, exploitation of the reservoir, uh, the water cut, the so-called percentage of water associated with the oil going to rise during the exploitation of the reservoir. So mm, the managing of the, the produced water is uh, of uh, high concern for the uh, hydrocarbon uh, processing industry. Uh, currently, mm, worldwide, the produced water are managed um, through reinjection in the deep formation and also for um, application dedicated to the hydrocarbon engineering um, industry uh, to improve the oil recovery as enhanced oil recovery or um, also um, reinjection to improve the um, convey, hydraulically convey the oil to the production wells. Um, but um, mm, Currently, um, almost uh, in, especially in the, the south region of Italy, there is some concern about uh, the technique of uh, reinjection in uh, of uh, produced water, um, as uh, in uh, all of the uh, region of the world is normally uh, used, and uh, especially in uh, Basilicata, where uh, ENI has uh, is uh, biggest. Uh, uh, oil center uh, is a, an oil center um, of a um, big capacity, about 100,000 barrels each day. And uh, in this region, we have a limit for the reinjection is about 2,000 cubic meters each day. And the water cut, the rising water cut, uh, the, the produced water associated with the oil produced must be managed also uh, over this uh, quantity um, within the limit of uh, uh, reinjection. So um, the quantity which exceed this, uh, this uh, this limit uh, must be managed um, by disposal, by tank truck uh, to external um, waste treatment plant. This, uh, uh, this concept is, uh, um, is um, uh, a problem for oil center. So um, starting from 2012, we um, developed a research development project to um, identify a technology to treat with a dedicated plant this produced water and to uh, obtain the uh, more goals by this kind of treatment, uh, particularly uh, to improve the sustainability of the oil center uh, in a circular economic um, way. Um, this plant um, is uh, able uh, to treat the produced water and to obtain uh, water um, treated, which are suitable for industrial reuse. So this, uh, this project uh, has these um, four drivers, Sust improve the sustainability, optimize water resources by treating and recovering, and making ENI 
self-sufficient in, in this uh, area, um, reducing and, uh, mm, and leading to zero the mm, the the the, in, the foot uh, in, the the the, the the contribution to uh, depletion of uh, uh, of uh, fresh water because uh, with this plant uh, the old center did not uh, need any more uh, water from other source so the the also to maintain the production level to the, the current value uh, the the first, the, the main steps of this this project are so depicted. Uh, we started in 2012 with uh, a, a very strong um, uh, campaign of uh, analysis uh, on uh, the um, produced water coming from the uh, the oil center. Uh, we started from the analytical, uh, uh, the statistical analysis of uh, all the, the trends of service in the, um, the the previous years, and started also a chemical characterization of uh, with another protocol, a more um, all the parameters uh, useful for the design of the new treatment plant. So we um, also other um, research and development. Uh, um, um, units of ENIs were involved in this project, uh, the, the labs of uh, um, Eni Donegani, uh, Novara, and Bolgiano. Uh, after the binge scale um, tests, we started um, uh, with a pilot plant after that we defined the sequence of treatment. And uh, in 2013-2014, we um, uh, Managed a little plant uh, to to treat uh, about uh, 800 cubic meters of uh, produced water coming directly by ten truck as as waste, obviously, from the uh, oil center of Giano. Uh, during this uh, pilot plant uh, pilot plant uh, um, campaign, we um, focused on uh, the efficiency of the process. We uh, evaluated the um, possibility to get. Uh, uh, water suitable for industrial use, and also evaluated the um, kind of chemicals, the quantity, uh, the waste uh, coming from the treatment, and all the specific, just to obtain um, a plant with uh, the um, reliability uh, that a plant dedicated to an oil center must have. Uh, in 2014, the, the results from pilot plant was used to um, elaborate the, um, the relation for the uh, um, for requiring the patent uh, for the technology because uh, we did not uh, discover the new unit operation for the treatment, but we um, set uh, this treatment in the right way um, to obtain the final result. Um, the final result was the water uh, with the um, purity for the feeding of boiler feed water um, um, production unit in the uh, oil center. Uh, from the research and development project, we started the engineering. Uh, after these uh, uh, robust values obtained by the uh, pilot plant uh, um, campaign, we started the engineering. So in 2017-2018, uh, we um, developed the front-end engineering design of a 72 cubic meters each hour uh, plant, and uh, we um, started the permitting procedure for the environmental impact asset procedure. Uh, the permitting procedure is uh, currently ongoing. We have a slide at the end. And uh, mm, uh, we also uh, started the uh, procedure for um, for for the for get the contract, and then we wait uh, for the permitting to start the uh, plant construction. Just some uh, uh, detail about the technology. Uh, these are the the photos of the pilot plant we uh, ran in 2013 and 2014 in a region in Italy. Um, the, the the unit operation used are the one depicted in this slide. Uh, the first is the oil removal, uh, free oil 
and dispersed it with the, an AP separator and uh, a dissolved glass protection unit. Uh, second uh, unit operation is the sulfites removal with the closed loop, closed loop um, uh, stripping uh, with the nitrogen. Um, it, this is uh, um, an operation which is uh, developed um, and at room temperature. It's not uh, with uh, with the steam or other. Um, or other unit at high temperature. And is performed with the normal uh, equipment from uh, wastewater treatment plant. Uh, then uh, the other operation is uh, uh, for the um, uh, reduction of the hardness in the in the in the liquid and uh, the um, settling of the heavy metals and uh, especially for uh, for boron, uh, we have a, a high quantity of boron in the produced water coming from the oil center in Valdagri. And then the other operation is the uh, removal of the uh, dissolved uh, organic, the residual of uh, hydrocarbon in the, in the liquid matrix, and also the removal of uh, nitrogen uh, by stripping in um, in, um, in, in in uh, with nitrogen, and then the the polishing with the granulated activated carbon. Uh, once we have removed the oil, the sulfides, the most of the metal nitrogen um, what uh, remain is the the salinity content which is uh, removed by ultrafiltration uh, before a reversal of osmosis um, step by two step or reversal of osmosis first and second step uh, the the part of uh, water we want to uh, reuse as a feed for uh, boiler um, for high pressure steam uh, are um, polished with electrodionization, but uh, another stream is obtained um, uh, uh, with high purity, also without electrodionization. Um, the, um, the plant uh, is uh, out of the boundary of the oil center. It, this slide the pitch the um, really simplified scheme of the oil center. Uh, the multi-phase uh, separator, the gas line, the oil line, and the water line. Uh, the water line has uh, its uh, uh, produced uh, water treatment, but this treatment is uh, treatment just to get the quality for the reinjection. Uh, the quantity which cannot be reinjected for exceeding the quantity limits authorized are sent currently to external disposal by 10 truck. The blue water plant is will be connected to uh, these uh, tanks with a, a dedicated interconnecting and they will treat this water to get 40 cubic meters each hour of water suitable to produce steam and 30 cubic meters or hour of water of high purity for other industrial use, cooling towers, hydraulic uh, seals, chemical preparation, etc. Um, the external waste produced by the, the plant will be disposed um, as a um, typical um, waste from a wastewater treatment. Uh, filter press cakes, exhaust the activity carbon, or salty reservoirs because we also set a zero, zero liquid discharge section to um, reduce the volume of the saline reject from salinity removal units. This is the, um, the simplified uh, block file uh, diagram. Uh, so from IP tank and the solved glass foundation and H2S stripper, after coagulation, flocculation, and uh, filter sand to remove the, um, the suspensed solid, then the nitrogen stripper, the section for uh, dissolved hydrocarbon and COD residual removal, the ultrafiltration, the reverse osmosis unit, and another section is for uh, the final boron removal. Uh, sorry, boron removal and then the um, managing of the saline rejet uh, is uh, coming from uh, reverse osmosis. Uh, this, uh, this reverse osmosis rejet uh, is also um, 
treated by uh, a mechanical vapor recompression unit to uh, reduce the quantity of waste to be managed and also to increase the quantity of water uh, to which can be recovered. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, these are um, the most uh, important characteristic of the of the plant. The the water which must be treated has this characteristic. Um, just to to be fast in my um, explanation, uh, term characterizing the this water are pH is quite uh, regular between 7.7 .7 and 7.3 is quite neutral. Uh, temperature up to 60 degrees centigrade. Um, a high quantity of uh, in suspended and solid depending of, uh, on upset on the uh, treatment units in the old the center. Um, not high content of uh, total petroleum and hydrocarbon, but sometimes for upset uh, in the unit, uh, it could rise to uh, um, thousand of ppm. H2S, hardness, a uh, high quantity of boron up to 92 milligram per liter, no mercury, uh, really low. And uh, um, BTEX, um, CO, COD is uh, uh, normally uh, lower than uh, 1000. And um, TDS is um, uh, up to not more than 17,000 milligram per liters. Uh, the technology is suitable up to 40, uh, 60 gram per liters. Over 60 gram per liters, the technology blue water is not suitable because it's based on uh, the reversal osmosis. And uh, over 60 gram per liters of uh, TDS, uh, reversal osmosis is not energically uh, suitable for uh, high pressure osmotic pressure in, in the unit. Uh, just some, uh, sorry. Okay, just some information about the uh, the layout of the plant, which uh, is uh, currently um, under permitting procedure. Uh, the oil, oil center um, is on the left of this picture, and this is uh, the interconnecting uh, under surface, um, about 700 meters. And this is the new plant we would like to uh, to start to 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 construct as soon as possible to uh, improve the sustainability of the oil center. Uh, currently, this is the really complex uh, route, uh, the roadmap for the permitting of the plant. We started the permitting procedure in uh, 2018. And uh, the first service conference was uh, done, was uh, um, kept in 2019. And we had a negative opinion by the superintendents for uh, archaeological and the landscape heritage. So we presented a new document to overcome the negative opinion by superintendents. And in 2020, uh, we get uh, this week, uh, last 20 of September, um, a favorable opinion by the Urban Planning Commission, uh, which uh, must be analyzed by the superintendents. So we hope the, to start uh, with the next uh, service conference and uh, obtain the permission, the complete permission to um, build the plant. Uh, the plant uh, is developed with the particular construction strategy um, just to be really fast in the uh, construction. Uh, we get the, the, um, uh, the, um, the contract with the, um, the um, contractor able to uh, realize the plant with our technology. And uh, this is the rendering of the of, of the plant, uh, so uh, we hope to start the, the building of the plant as soon as possible. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Signor Rossini, for this presentation and also very interesting um, real scale project. Uh, so uh, it was uh, a pleasure to uh, listen to you. Um, I will maybe uh, give the floor now to UC uh, to uh, present the next uh, speaker. Thank you, Piotr, and thanks from my side also to Manil Lidio for a great presentation. So 
Our next uh, speaker will be Tayana Simetic or Simetic. Sorry for my pronunciation it, again. Uh, she's a research assistant at the University of Novi Sad, and um, she is engaging in research in the field of chemistry and environmental protection with an emphasis on the UV-based advanced oxidation processes for removal of natural organic matters and specific organic micropollutants from water. And today she will be talking about the decoration of alacrol, alacrol by UVC activated peroxide monosulfide treatment. So please, Tayana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I also want to, to greet everyone present in the session. And uh, I will speak uh, this uh, in presentation about the degradation of uh, organic pollutant in water by uh, application of advanced oxidation process. In recent years, the rapidly growing global population and economic development have resulted in serious adverse environmental impacts, bringing priority and emerging micro pollutions into increasing focus. Micropollutions are often detected in water bodies at trace levels as a result of human activities, including modern industry, farms, and even domestic wastewaters. And their impact in the environment is a growing concern. Conventional water treatments using uh, physical chemical and biological processes are unable to eliminate these compounds from water. So recently agreed attention uh, has been paid to improving water treatment. Advanced oxidation processes are new treatment processes die, uh, due to their high treatment efficiency and possible low cost. Depending on the specific water characteristics, advanced oxidation process can be used to degradate different micropollutants into less complex and less harmful byproducts. So, uh, sulfate, a uh, radical based advanced oxidation process has attracted increasing attention as an alternative for traditional hydroxyl radical based advanced oxidation process uh, by to its high uh, oxidation ability and uh, adjustability to generating uh, hydroxyl radical via pH, uh, mani uh, pH uh, manipulation. Generally, sulfate radical can be uh, generated uh, from the activation of uh, peroxime. Uh, this sulfate or peroxymonosulfate by various methods such as UV irradiation. Uh, UV uh, activation is uh, considered uh, environmental friendly and efficient uh, way to activate uh, uh, peroxymonosulfate uh, to generate uh, reactive oxidative species because uh, it uh, doesn't introduce secondary pollution. The, uh, the herbicide alohor was uh, subjected to the present research uh, due to its toxicity and poor uh, biodegradability, and but to a clear hazard to surface and groundwater quality. Uh, the objective of uh, this study were investigation of efficiency and uh, kinetics of alohor degradation in, dif in different water samples by direct UV photolysis and the UV peroxymonosulfate process and uh, investigate uh, the impact of some important parameters, including the concentration of uh, peroxymonosulfate, those UV influence, and the influence of bi uh, bicarbonate and natural organic matter uh, on the degradation alachlor. Ultra pure water. Uh, was used as a control, uh, synthetic control matrix. Additional synthetics, uh, uh, synthetics um, samples were prepared uh, containing humic acid in different concentration from uh, 2 to uh, 12 milligram carbon per liter and hydrogen carbonate in the range concentration from 100 to 500 milligram per liter at uh, pH uh, 7.2. All synthetic water samples were uh, spiked with uh, alachlor in order to obtain an initial concentration about 100 microgram per, uh, per liter. Direct UV photolysis and UV peroxymonosulfa treatments uh, were carried out in photochemical reactor, which is uh, shown on the slide. A low pressure mercury 
uh, UV lamp was used and uh, emitting monochromatic UV radiation at uh, 254 uh, uh, nanometer. Before the start of each treatment, the lamp was warmed for 20 minutes. After warm up, the reactor was uh, filled uh, with the water samples and uh, peroxymonosulfate added at concentration of uh, 0 0.03 and uh, 0 0.3 millimole. The applied uh, UV lines uh, were in the range from um, 10 to 1,400 millijoule per square centimeter, depending on the type of treat water. The concentration of alcohol was analyzed using GCMS system. The effects of uh, hydroxyl, uh, the effects of uh, direct UV photolysis at the UV peroxyphonosulfate process on the degradation of alcohol in uh, ultra pure water are show, uh, showed on the slide. Direct, direct uh, uh, photolysis was achieved alcohol degradation in the range of 4 uh, to uh, 92 percent with the extent um, uh, with the extent of alcohol degradation increasing uh, with increasing UV influence up to 1400 millijoule per uh, square centimeter uh, faster and more efficient alcohol degradation was observed using UV peroxy monosulfate treatment. As a result, hydroxyl and uh, sulfate radical attack formed during uh, peroxy monosulfate uh, photolysis on the pollution molecules. Application of uh, 100 uh, millijoule per uh, square uh, squared centimeter uh, and uh, lower uh, dose uh, peroxymonosulfate of uh, 0 0.03 millimole uh, ensures maximum alcohol degradation in a contrast uh, to contribution of uh, direct UV photolysis, which, less, uh, which was le uh, less than uh, 4%. The influence of direct you, uh, uh, the influence of different uh, humic acid concentration, the, the alcohol degradation are shown in the slide. Uh, the range of humic acid concentration was uh, chosen to cover different concentration of uh, natural organic matter found in the surface water and groundwater from uh, the northern part of Republic of Serbia. The presence of humic acid was found to reduce the efficiency of alcohol degradation uh, compared with uh, the ultra pure water, increasing. Uh, Increasing uh, uh, humic acid concentration in the synthetic matrix uh, led to greater inhibition effect and decreasement of, of efficiency uh, degradation process. During uh, direct UV photolysis, uh, degradation of alcohol decreased uh, from um, uh, 75 uh, to 53% with increase of initial uh, humic acid concentra concentration uh, from uh, 2 uh, milligram carbon per liter to 12 uh, milligram carbon per liter. In the case uh, UV peroxymonosulfate of treatment, a high uh, degree uh, alcohol degradation about uh, uh, 95% uh, uh, was achieved in the presence of humic acid of uh, 2 and 5 milligram carbon per liter at a higher dose uh, peroxymonosulfate uh, yeah, and uh, UV influence of 1000 uh, millijoule per square centimeter. However, in the presence of a, a greater amounts of uh, humic acid of uh, uh, 12 milligram carbon per liter, increasing the initial oxidation concentration uh, didn't uh, result in a significant more efficiency alcohol degradation. Uh, this result uh, can be attributed to uh, the scavenging effects uh, of the humic acid towards uh, hydroxyl radical and sulfate radicals and the uh, inner filter effect of humic acid for the photoreaction. Uh, uh, the influence of a hydrogen 
carbonate, one of the main ions in the natural water, waste, water, or secondary influence are shown in the slide. Increasing the initial concentration of hydrogen carbonate in the synthetic water matrix decreased alcohol degradation under UV, uh, UV light compared with the degradation achieved in ultra pure uh, water. Uh, by applying uh, direct UV photolysis, uh, the degree of alcohol degradation uh, slightly decrease from 90 to uh, uh, 83 percent and uh, with an increase in the initial concentration of hydro hydrogen carbonate. In the case uh, UV peroxy monosulfate treatment, a uh, uh, lower dose uh, peroxy monosulfate of uh, 0.03 millimole, uh, almost complete degradation of alachlor was observed, uh, uh, was obtained uh, at dose uh, UV fluence uh, 1,000 1, millijoule per square centimeter in a matrix with uh, hydrogen carbonate uh, 100, 100 milligram, uh, milligram per liter and 250 milligram per liter. While uh, with increase uh, in the dose peroxy monosulfate uh, in a matrix with um, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen carbonate of uh, 100 and uh, 250 milligram per liter, uh, almost complete degradation was observed uh, at a dose of UV influence of uh, 600 millijoule per squared. Uh, centimeter. The negative effect of uh, hyd hydrogen carbonate on uh, alcohol degradation uh, can be a consequence on the direct reaction between uh, hydrogen carbonate and the peroxy monosulfate, uh, mono where um, uh, hydrogen carbonate uh, to be an oxygen acceptor in this reaction, leading to uh, generation of uh, peroxy monocarbonate. Uh, then uh, photolysis of uh, peroxy uh, monocarbonate uh, led to formation of uh, hydro uh, hydroxyl and carbonate radicals, which can uh, which can uh, uh, degrade uh, degrade uh, the, the target uh, compound. Uh, this slide shows the concentration of alcohol degradation, uh, where uh, we clearly see that uh, highest. Uh, constant was obtained in ultra pure water. The above results suggested uh, that inhibition effect of uh, humic acid is more pronounced than uh, uh, hydrogen carbonate, especially in the case uh, uh, higher uh, dose um, peroxy monosulfate, uh, where uh, is uh, constant are up to try, uh, three uh, times lower lower in the lower in the matrix with uh, humic uh, acid uh, while at uh, lower uh, dose uh, peroxy monosulfate uh, sulfate this uh, difference uh, somewhat less pronounced and uh, intermediates of alcohol uh, photodegradation uh, were analyzed in ultra pure water and uh, the uh, structures uh, by projects detect from alafor degradation and UV uh, peroxy monosulfate process are given uh, in this slide. Uh, the proposed pathway, uh, pathway of alafor degradation includes uh, cleavage uh, and, um, and a methoxy methyl group and, uh, and chloroacetyl group. Uh, and so oxidation um, of aryl ethyl uh, group and cyclization uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, cleavage uh, of the benzene ring to carboxylic acid. A more detailed uh, pathway of alcohol degradation is uh, shown is our study by Molnar at all 2020. It's also uh, it's also uh, shown in the study the influence of different process parameters on the degradation of alachlor using a combination uh, UV radiation with uh, hydro, uh, hydrogen uh, peroxide, persulfate, and uh, peroxo uh, monosulfate. And conclusion uh, UV peroxy monosulfate uh, oxidation process. Uh, provide uh, to be more efficient uh, than uh, direct UV photolysis for alcohol degradation in tested water samples. 
process uh, parameters uh, such as initial concentration of peroxy monosulfate as well as water components typical present in water environment such as humic acid and hydrogen carbonate uh, were showed a very degree of impact on the first order order rate constant uh, thank you for your attention Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tayana, for uh, this interesting uh, presentation and the examples that you uh, have shown to us. Um, I will go to the uh, next uh, speaker. I see that uh, Nazaria Marki is uh, with us. Um, and uh, Nazaria uh, works uh, in the Geological and Soil Service of the uh, Emilia-Romagna region. Uh, she's a so soil specialist, expert in regional policies and cartography. Uh, she deals with uh, soil management uh, in the field of excavated materials, soil ecosystems, um, and uh, their services. Uh, so uh, the title of the presentation is uh, Pedology uh, in Support of the Legislation on the Use of Sewage Sludge, uh, a case study in uh, Emilia-Romagna. So, uh, Nazaria, the floor is yours. Um, yes, uh, tell me if you see my... I see the screen and uh, not in the presentation mode yet. Okay. Uh, so uh, the full the full screen. Okay, I'm trying to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, just a minute that uh, I. Mm -hmm. I try again. Okay. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, uh, this is full screen now. Perfect. It's okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I will be a little bit uh, a voice from outside because uh, I will uh, talk uh, about the soil uh, and uh, the um, soil knowledge in support of the environmental legislation and uh, in particular for the use of uh, seaway sludge. And I will bring here the experience of uh, Emilia Romagna region. Um, in uh, 2014, we had an issue in Emilia Romagna um, tied to the arsenic uh, content in seaway sludges. Uh, in fact, we had these parameters in our regional resolution with the ve limit value of 10 ppm that came from, uh, from a compost degree. But this parameter wasn't uh, present in the list of the national legislation. And uh, on the other side, um, the uh, tomato canning industries of uh, uh, Parma province um, um, had the values in their, uh, um, in their sludges that uh, were, uh, were very close to this uh, value of 10 ppms. And uh, as the sludges were mainly made by the region's uh, materials without any addition of chemical external uh, substances, and as the um, background content of uh, um, soil in the Emilia Romagna region is uh, mostly uh, near 10 uh, ppm, they asked to remove these uh, parameters from the regional legislation. Uh, Emilia Romagna region uh, aging uh, on the base of the precautionary uh, principle. Uh, decided to uh, allow a period of uh, tra transition management of the um, canning industry um, seaway sludge for uh, province of Parma and created a, a working group uh, that uh, had to deal with, uh, this, uh, with this issue. And the, the working group was the operating protocol committee. And uh, uh, it included uh, all the stakeholders 
so Emilia Romagna region for the DG environment and DG agriculture and uh, uh, the seven canning tomato industries, the uh, local bodies uh, in charge for the authorization of sewage spreading and the regional um, uh, environment protection agency with the different uh, uh, sectors. What were the aim and objectives of the protocol? Um, uh, it was, uh, uh, they were mainly four, uh, which were the, uh, the study of the problem relative to the characteristic of the sludge in relation to the content of arsenic, the analytical method that uh, had to be uh, shared in order to identify those with a more limited variability, the deepening of the effects of sludge spreading on agricultural soil, and uh, last but not least, uh, the management optimization and uh, the update of the regional uh, provision. Uh, uh, to do this, uh, to sorry, uh, to deal with all these topics, uh, we had uh, made many insights, particularly on sludge, analytical method, uh, water, soil, and plants. And uh, now we are going to focus on the uh, soil ones, uh, soil and sewage uh, um, one. Why? Because in this case, uh, the relationship between soil and sludge uh, was uh, closer than ever. Um, in fact, it is well known that the arsenic, uh, as other metal background content, uh, is linked to the amendments used, so even the use of uh, seaway sludges. And in this case, the sludges uh, were made uh, mainly by the soil on the tomatoes screen. And uh, we had to um, analyze uh, the uh, effect of uh, the sludge spreading uh, with the aim of uh, understand better what uh, will be the, uh, the, um, the impact on the area of uh, on agricultural area. Uh, how to deal, uh, oh, how to deal with, uh, with uh, these uh, topics. The solution was to, um, to identify experimental fields in which uh, we could observe an, uh, a, a monitored agronomic management and a monitored uh, sludge uh, environmental quality. Uh, these, uh, uh, these are the uh, seven uh, areas, seven uh, experimental fields, uh, and uh, in this case, uh, the stakeholders, the tomato canning industries, uh, uh, were actors and active in the work of the group. Uh, and they give us the possibility to choose between their uh, pertaining areas and uh, to select uh, the one that uh, has to be authorized to the seaway uh, spreading from 2015 until 2018. Uh, then we had to, to check the owner availability and uh, at the end we choose the uh, seven areas of uh, two hectares, more or less two, extra, uh, two hectares of extension uh, which were homogeneous for soil and management. And among these seven areas, we choose to blank without uh, spreading. This is uh, the roadmap of, uh, of our work. And um, as you can see on uh, 2014, August, there was a subscribed the uh, protocol and uh, it ended because it was uh, postponed in October two, uh, 2018. First of all, we made a soil survey and uh, um, next uh, from 2015 until 2018, we made every year soil sampling and analysis before the sludge spreading. And uh, as far as arsenic parameters, so we uh, determined the total content and the bioavailable content. And uh, for three years, uh, from uh, 2015 to 2017, we made a sludge analysis before the sludge spreading. 
for the last two years, not, not the last, but for two years, we had the, the possibility, thank you to uh, Piacenza University, to analyze uh, uh, plants uh, arsenic content through acid, acid digestion. And uh, so we had this uh, last ring of, uh, of the chain. Uh, as I told, the uh, soil survey was uh, the first, uh, the first uh, step because uh, we had uh, to identify the soil, uh, the soil type we were uh, um, studying and, uh, and uh, we had to identify the starting content of uh, arsenic and, uh, um, and then uh, follow this aspect for the next uh, three years. Uh, as you can see, we, uh, we made a, a handhold uh, manual uh, soil survey according to the uh, regional manuals and uh, we um, attributed all our pedologic observation to a soil typologic unit and we find out that they were representative of the, pa of the Parma province soils, main soils, and uh, we checked the arsenic content with our uh, arsenic uh, background map. And uh, uh, we found out that uh, mainly the, the soil were uh, um, congruent with the, the um, classes of content of our map and uh, with uh, uh, similar soil. So the first aim uh, was, as I told, uh, to characterize the sludge in relation to the content of the arsenic element. Uh, starting from the hypothesis that the, the, the sludge uh, is made, may, was made mainly by the soil on the tomato skin, the, the, uh, we, we, the, the object of this action was to find in the sludge the footprint of the uh, tomato area of production background uh, content of arsenic. And we thought to do it uh, through the, uh, again, through the availability of the tomato canning industries because we asked them the load data of the tomato um, area of production the, for the 15 days before the sludge analysis because 15 days are uh, the, uh, the time of permanence of the sludge in the uh, tomato canning industries plants. And so uh, in, this, uh, in this way, we could have the, exactly the composition of the sludge that uh, we uh, would have put on our experimental fields. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the provenance of the tomato, uh, the tomato area of um, origins uh, were mainly uh, in Emilia-Romagna region and uh, only uh, for the 30% from outside uh, Emilia-Romagna. Uh, we asked the detail of the province, uh, of the provinces, but uh, even of the municipality, because uh, uh, this uh, this shape, uh, this uh, detail was very useful for us uh, when we asked the information from outside the region, as I I will show you. Um, um, as I told, uh, um, being in Emilia Romagna, mostly the production of the tomatoes, uh, it was uh, quite easy uh, to um, to um, calculate the, the to calculate the background value for arsenic, uh, because we had uh, the map and we had the data set used to build the map. Uh, as far as the outside uh, um, areas of origin, we asked uh, the body in charge of Veneto region, Piemonte region, and Lombardia region to give us uh, a, an official uh, value for the area um, of production. And uh, in two cases, Piemonte and Veneto, they gave us uh, this, uh, this data. Uh, Lombardia, um, for, uh, for uh, Regione Lombardia, we used the, the data of uh, Progetto Soil. So uh, we had all the elements to, uh, uh, to put in relationship our sludge 
uh, which uh, was uh, analyzed by the regional environment protection agency laboratories and the uh, background arsenic content of the area of uh, um, origin of, of the tomatoes and uh, these are the, the real uh, this is the graphic with the, the results as you can see the correlation is uh, quite uh, interesting uh, and uh, um, and uh, uh, for us uh, it was uh, a confirmation of our starting hypothesis um, of our starting hypothesis so just uh, to wrap up uh, um, the starting hypothesis, uh, namely that the nature of the tomato processing sludges were ma was mainly terrigenous and uh, that the arsenic content was uh, linked to the arsenic content of the land was confirmed. Uh, um, it was uh, impossible uh, because of the different sourcing as underlying the data uh, used to construct the diagram eliminated the possibility of forcing the result. Uh, for the extra error data, we had uh, uh, different formats, but they, however, proved to be useful for the analysis. The second aims that involved the soil was the uh, characterization and, uh, uh, of soil with respect of arsenic parameter, but uh, mostly the, um, to verify what, what were the effects of arsenic accumulation in the soil as a result of agronomic use. Here you see the diagrams, and uh, if you remember, we had the two areas without uh, spreading, and uh, um, we have uh, two diagrams because uh, um, uh, in the last year, we had the breakdown in communication and we lost our uh, two blank areas in uh, 2018. Anyway, as you can see, for four type of soil uh, on five type, we have that uh, there is um, an accumulation, the second year of uh, seaway is, is a large spreading, then there is a decrease, and uh, in, uh, from the third year, um, the uh, soil con total content starts to increase again. Uh, and uh, these seem uh, to be regardless to the sludge arsenic content, uh, as you can see in the diagram below, because uh, um, this trend is confirmed for all uh, the five uh, uh, experimental fields. Uh, as you can see clearly, the two blanks area um, uh, have seen only a decreasing in arsenic total content. Uh, we went further in the assessment uh, regarding the metal content in soil because uh, we wanted to, uh, to know and to understand uh, what uh, was uh, uh, the bioavailable portion of arsenic uh, in order to understand uh, the potential, uh, potential risk for the uh, food chain in cultivated soil. Uh, to do this, uh, we used the, the um, uh, ammonium nitrite extract uh, because this is the same uh, methodologic analytical method used in the uh, German uh, um, Soil Protection Act. Um, and so we could uh, compare our results with the values of German legislation because in Italy there isn't uh, uh, um, there isn't, uh, uh, there aren't a trigger or threshold values for this uh, parameter. As you can see, we found very low values and uh, they were of two magnitude uh, uh, lower than the trigger value for agricultural soil of, uh, German, of uh, German legislation. The last ring of the chain was uh, to uh, have a look, uh, unfortunately with uh, only few data, of what happens, uh, of what happened in plants. 
and uh, we saw that uh, um, they, uh, we had only two years of uh, analysis and uh, um, as you see the results uh, for wet because they are the only data we are um, that can be compared from in the two years we can say uh, that uh, the um, better relationship between the bioavailable content in soil and the content in plant is the, uh, the data of 2016, which is the year of uh, the most accumulation in soil. The other thing that we can do is that uh, um, our uh, content uh, the in plants, in wet particularly, uh, was uh, congruent uh, with the literature data uh, from uh, the um, National Environmental Protection Agency, uh, a study that was made in, 2000, uh, um, in 2010 uh, uh, for the average value for Emilia Romagna, but even for the range of values of uh, Parma province. So uh, just to wrap up again, uh, we have seen that in soil type, the second year in, in mostly all soil type, the second year of application corresponded to an increase of acyanic content, which tended to decrease in the third year and then to rise to rose again. In the blanks, there was only uh, decrease, and uh, this appears to happen regardless to the arsenic concentration in the sludge. The bioavailable content of arsenic was always two orders of magnitude lower than the trigger value of German legislation uh, with the same analytical method, so the results are, um, are um, congruent. And uh, the data were insufficient to establish a certain relationship between the bioavailable arsenic content in the soil but, and, plant, and in the plants. However, a correlation was observed for wet, especially for the data of 2016. The arsenic content in plants was higher in the year of the greatest accumulation in the soil. The, so the value in wet, the grain, were congruent with the literature values. What happened? Uh, it happened that in 2018 um, was issued a national legislation, the law number 130 of November 16th, and this in Article 41 introduced the threshold values of 20 ppm for arsenic in the seaways laws. Uh, so we had now a national uh, threshold values. Nevertheless, the committee of the operating protocol considered important in order to maintain the environmental quality of the regional soil to leave the value of 10 ppm as a sort of trigger value uh, in Emilia Romagna region. And now if the value found in a sludge is between 10 and 20, which is the national threshold, the soil on which it was used cannot be subjected to spreading in the following two years. The report on the activity uh, made by the operating committee is uh, now contained in Annex 2 of the resolution of the Regional Council uh, number 326 of Emilia Romagna region. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nazaria. It was an interesting presentation, um, also from the uh, point of view of the JRC, because uh, we are now providing uh, some support to DG Environment in the revision uh, of the sewage slash directive. So, so we are involved in different uh, activities around of what you have uh, presented. Thank you very much for the, the presentation. Uh, and uh, I will give the floor to uh, you, now. Okay, so the next speaker will be um, Chiara Deloli, who is scientific researcher at ENEA, the Italian National Agency for New Technologies, Energy and Sustainable Economic Development. She has a PhD in Geological Sciences from the University of Ferrara. So please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. 
So can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see okay. it well. Okay. So respect to the other presentation, uh, I wanted to give you uh, an example of a different methodology using the radioisotopes to better qualify the quality of water and especially the wastewater. Uh, so the, the aim of uh, wastewater treatment is to remove as much of the suspended solid as possible before the remaining water is discharged back to the environment. As uh, solid material decays, it is used up oxygen, which is needed by plants and animals that live in the water. So uh, the isotopes are always around us and uh, um, relating to water quality is more important to use the isotope hydrology through stable and radioactive isotopes that are present in water to trace its processes. The isotope hydrology uses both stable and unstable isotopes. Stable isotopes are non-radioactive, meaning they don't emit radiation. And on the other side, unstable isotopes, or called radioactive isotopes, undergo radioactive decay and are therefore radioactive. Example of stable isotopes that are generally used to trace origin or genesis of aquifers are deuterium, carbon-14, nitrogen-15, or oxygen-18 uh, the primary. And uh, an example of radioactive isotopes generally used to clock hydrological processes as, for example, tritium or carbon-14. An example of uh, the use of stable isotopes in hydrology especially uh, using to, um, to better characterize the chemical and isoto isotopic composition of the pollutant. Uh, here an example of the nit nitrate ion, which is made of, up of nitrogen and oxygen. It is a common pollutant. The nitrogen has two stable isotopes of different weight, 14 and 15. And this difference in weight is uh, not the same in human waste and in fertilizer. The fertilizers use nitrogen from the air, whereas humans and animals go through a biological processes that change the nitrogen into different forms. The result is that the pollutants came from different kinds of sources, and these different kinds of sources can be identified based on this isotopic weight difference. These are uh, um, a table that um, explain the main important radioactive isotope used in hydrology, so tritium, carbon-14, or other, in which you can see the initial content in one liter of groundwater. And as you can see, for all these radioactive isotopes, the content in water is very low. So in uh, the hydrology, some uh, natural radioactive isotopes that are normally present in water, for example, tritium or carbon-14, and also novel gas radioisotopes, are generally used to estimate the groundwater age. Uh, can uh, be from a few months or and to a million years. But they are also used uh, to characterize the vulnerability and the sustainability of the water resources. Why this? Because these isotopes decay over time and their abundance decreases as the years go by. So when you analyze the sample of water, if you find a higher value of radioisotopes, this means that you are analyzing younger water. On the opposite, if you find a very lower value of the radio radioisotopes in your water samples, this means that you are analyzing an old water. For example, the groundwater with a detectable amount of tritium may be up to around 60 years old, whereas groundwater with no tritium must be older. While tritium is used for dating, especially groundwater that has been recently recharged, uh, the carbon-14 is used for water up to 40,000 years of age. 
or uh, for example, Krypton 81 at the end of uh, right part of the slide uh, is used to characterize water up to a million years old and so on. But uh, the radioactive isotopes in hydrology uh, are not only important to date, but to find the pollution because pollutants in surface water and also groundwater come from different kinds of sources or may be present naturally due to the geochemical processes that taking place in aquifers. In Italy, but also in other countries, uh, agriculture, industry and households each produce different kinds of pollutants in water. And this is an example in which you can see that agriculture or industry or house, uh, houses uh, could create pollutants, for example, in the atmosphere or in water, but uh, also the pollutant in the atmosphere or in the soil could um, increase the pollution in the, the groundwater. So knowing the origins of pollutants is more important and represents the first step in addressing problems with the water quality. And this uh, uh, allow and provide support and solution also to the policy makers, especially in the strategic planning and the management of water resources. So uh, the radio, use uh, the radioactive isotope in hydrology it is useful to better characterize the water quality. And uh, uh, using radioactive isotopes uh, could uh, give a marker for identification of the quality of water, but also could be used uh, as early warning of something happened. Uh, especially the gamma emitting radioisotopes uh, can be used as indicators of environmental pollution, or as we know, as precursor of accidental situation or plant degradation. Therefore, monitoring the tritium, that is a beta emitter radioisotopes, and the gamma emitting radioisotopes in the environment and also in the surrounding of nuclear plants or radioactive waste storage is fundamental. But not only in the surrounding of nuclear plants or radioactive waste storage. This is a, a, an example of the tritium content in the, the meteoric water collected in Italy, in Tuscany and in Liguria. And uh, the peak that you can see is the, the peak of the bomb peak related to the thermonuclear explosion in the atmosphere. And at the end of the peak, the situation of the tritium concentration in meteoric water is stable, but is very low, lower than 10 tritium units. But there are in literature a lot of research. This is an example of a research by Piero Manetti that collected and analyzed the landfill leachit in which the tritium concentration are between 2, sorry, 200 and 1,050,000 000 units. And in some cases, reach a value of over 3,000 lithium units. Last year in Remtech, we present uh, um, a work in which uh, in the Treviso aquifer, we have a high concentration of tritium related to the pollution of the aquifer. So the tritium is more important to better characterize the quality of the water. This is an example uh, of the use of stable and radioactive isotopes in hydrology using uh, delta carbon 14 as a stable uh, um, isotopes and the tritium as a radioactive isotopes. As you can see, the non-contaminated water colored in the black uh, show a very low concentration of tritium and low concentration of delta carbon 13. On the opposite, the contaminated water, so the leachate water colored in red, show high concentration of tritium and high concentration of delta carbon 13. And so using stable and radioactive isotopes is more important in the radioecology to better define the pollution of the environment. The radioecology is the study of the behavior and the effects of the radioactive elements in the environment and uh, are more important, is, sorry, is more important because uh, um, in, uh, through the radioecology, it is possible to investigate the exposure of humans, 
and other organisms to the radiation, both natural or anthropogenic origin. The characterization of the radioisotopes in the environment is more important, and for this reason, all the radioisotopes or the limit of the, all the radioisotopes are regulated by the law. Evaluating and quantify, especially quantify, the presence of the radioisotopes in the environment allows to understand the quality of the analyzed matrix that uh, it, it could be a solid, liquid, or gas, and uh, could identify possible source of pollution. The analysis of the radioisotopes requires a good capacity of measurement in concentration below the detection limit. And this is possible only through a useful procedure and analysis with low level background. The Eneas Environmental Traceability and Radiometry Laboratory is a part of the Fusion and Technology for Nuclear Safety and Security Department and part of the Nuclear Safety and Sustainability Division. The name, the completed name, is Methods and Techniques for Nuclear Safety Monitoring and Traceability Laboratory. The laboratory is part of the high technology network uh, in the Emilia Romagna region called the Technopolo and uh, is at the forefront of the analysis, especially of the radioisotopes in the environment in the two different research centers in the Brasimone, that is in the Apennine Mountain, and in the city of Bologna. In this uh, presentation, I want to give you an example of uh, this case study, the company Tintes is uh, located in the Veneto region in uh, orange in the Italian map. And uh, it has an excellent wastewater treatment plant with two biological treatment tanks downstream of a chemical physical treatment system. What we do is to collect two different kinds of sample on the wastewater treatment plant and analyzed on the traceability laboratory in Bologna and Brasilone. The samples, so is water, water samples, were subject to distillation and electrolytic system and then analyzed by liquid distillation counting to identify and quantify the concentration of tritium. And um, in addition, the gamma emitting radioisotopes were identifying using a portable gamma spectrometer. In addition to this, a small quantity of the two samples were diluted and then analyzed by an ICP-MS triple quadrupole to assess whether metal pollutants remained after the purification at the end of the wastewater treatment plant. And also Raman spectroscopy was used to better identify the organic molecules. But in this presentation, I, focus, I want to focus your attention only on the tritium and the gamma emitting radioisotopes. So the samples were prepared through distillation and, and uh, enrichment electrolytic system. The tritiated water obtained was mixed with a scintillating liquid and analyzed on the quantums. It is a low background instrument that allows to carry out analysis even in non underground laboratories, thanks to an active and a passive shielding. The, the gamma emitting radioisotopes um, was used in, uh, to analyze a distilled sample. So it is, uh, the, the analysis was done on the dry residue using the, the, a portable gamma spectrometer and the shielding. Why a shielding? Because the presence of the gamma emitting radioisotopes in the samples are very, very low. And uh, we need uh, a shielding to uh, better, to, um, sorry, um, to, um, to have a very low background. Here, an example of uh, four different kind of analysis of the background without the shielding and with the use of shielding. I know that the numbers are very small, but uh, I, I circle. Uh, in uh, light blue, as you can see, in uh, without the shielding, the background start up to one to level one, and with the shielding, the background starts lower the one value. So, with the use of the use of the shielding, 
is uh, to better characterize a very low background of gamma emitting radioisotopes present in the sample. This is our results. As you can see, uh, we, we don't find uh, anything. So we found only um, potassium 40 that is not present in the background, but in the dry residue, there aren't gamma emitting radioisotopes. And the same is for tritium that is uh, lower the, uh, the, um, the limit imposed by the regulation. So, uh, Yes, the isotopes are generally used to date, to, to found the genesis of the water, to analyze the recharge speed, the vulnerability of the aquifer and the climate change. But it is also important to use the radioisotopes also to find the pollution in the water. In this case, tritium is used as a marker to date aquifer before or after 10 years and especially a marker for specific type of pollution. In addition, the gamma emitting radioisotopes are more related to accidents and a better follow the water flow because they are dissolved in it and bind to dispersed particles. So the presence of tritium and gamma emitting radioisotopes in wastewater could give important information regarding the presence or not of the pollutants on the water samples analyzed. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Chiara. Uh, Yussi wanted uh, to intervene. Yeah, no, no, no problem. I was uh, struggling with my equipment here. So <laughs> thank you so much on my behalf also, Chiara, for your excellent presentation on the radio isotopes. And now, well, I will let Piotr to introduce our next and last speaker of the session. Okay, uh, with pleasure. Uh, so, um, Professor Alexandros Stefanakis um, uh, will be presenting the use of nature-based solution for circular management and reuse of oily produced water uh, in um, oil and gas industry. Uh, uh, the professor has um, an extensive knowledge and experience in uh, wetlands for water pollution control uh, because he's a uh, coordinator um, of African Middle East on those uh, issues. Um, and um, he also conducted uh, a lot of uh, constructed wetlands project in Europe, Middle East, Africa, and uh, US and South uh, America. Uh, so with this extensive uh, knowledge, uh, he deals with uh, environmental um, issues and uh, uh, also teaches them at the, at the university. Um, please, uh, the floor is uh, yours, uh, Alexandros. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Yet. Uh, now? Something is coming on the screen. Yes, I see yes, the okay. presentation. Now it's okay. Okay. Uh, th that's a presenter mode. Can you uh, let me swap the switch? Uh -huh. yes. Now it's full screen. Perfect. Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, my presentation has to do as we saw before about produce water management from the oil and gas industry, but in this case, with a different technology and a completely uh, different uh, approach. So, of course, the trigger here is always um, what we are discussing these last years, how we can um, uh, implement the new model of circular economy. And actually, uh, we still need to define the exact contents and how we perceive uh, circularity, but I think we all agree that um, we need more circular options in different sectors, in different fields, and this is because we have many challenges globally, regionally, and uh, locally to, to face, um, considering that most of us live in cities, uh, we need to upgrade and build more new infrastructure in the coming years, and of course there is this uh, big um, uh, crisis of climate change and all their related impacts. So
So considering all of these, we knew also means that we knew different type, different kind and different approach, different solutions to deal with all these uh, different issues and problems. And within this context, uh, nature-based solutions is a new approach uh, to deal with some of these issues. And this is why um, we, by using nature-based solutions, uh, we can provide sustainable solutions, meaning solutions which we, um, we copy or we are inspired or buy from nature. And the goal is to utilize as much as possible na natural processes, natural materials, natural components, to minimize not just um, the environmental impact, but also the impact of the process itself. So when it comes to nature-based solutions for wastewater management, a field where uh, a lot of research is carried out uh, these last years, of course, one of the questions that comes in the forefront um, is how can we do it? What are the solutions? Which technological level? Uh, readiness level are these solutions? Are there examples? And of course, do we have large scale examples or is it just something that we have in the laboratory or in a small scale only? And of course, how we can attract funding? Who, where can fund such uh, solutions? So here I will give you an example of such a system uh, that was designed and built uh, for the oil and gas uh, industry. So as we saw also before the this sector, this industrial sector, uses up to 10% and uh, is responsible for up to 10% of the total fresh water with drawer. This means that uh, this industry is a significant user of water at the local level. And these are the different uh, segments, the different types where we uh, session, uh, sections, where we have water consumption, water using the oil and gas industry. So the challenge here is to optimize this whole industrial process to reduce the costs and of course, to reduce the whole environmental uh, footprint of the whole process. And when we talk about produce water, what we should remember in, in few words is that when we hear or when we say, oh, we found oil there, we don't find oil per se, hydrocarbons, we find water that contains the hydrocarbons. So when we pump out the water, uh, we have some separation and recovery processes there in order to recover the hydrocarbons. But this also means that this water uh, remains as a byproduct, as a wastewater, and still con is contaminated with residual hydrocarbons. And to, to give you an idea, in, many, in some oil fields, to produce one barrel of oil means that we will generate up to 10 barrels of this contaminated water. So you understand the huge volume of this so-called produced water that is generated during oil exploration and how difficult it is for this industry also to properly manage um, this uh, wastewater. Uh, globally, um, the most widely applied management method is through deep well disposal. So we reintroduce this wastewater back to the aquifer so that we can pump again and again and recover as much as possible as um, uh, the, the oil uh, content. Of course, when we this uh, ratio uh, starts increasing, this process becomes unfeasible and uh, both technically and uh, especially financially. So uh, in the Middle East, we have such a case study. It is uh, one uh, oil uh, field in the south east corner of the Middle East in Oman. It produces 270,000 cubic meters of day of this produced uh, water, oily contaminated water. And in that area, again, the traditional method um, for disposal of this water is the deep well uh, disposal. And in this picture here, uh, you can see uh, how big is only one such site with these uh, very large uh, pumps. So the goal here was exactly to replace uh, many of these uh, disposal pumps with a new technology, ecological, sustainable, uh, technology. And uh, here we used um, the technology of a nature based solution, a technology name known as constructed wetlands. So, this is the area uh, before, uh, a typical desert, as uh, you can see. Uh, and this is this project. So, after three consecutive expansion uh, phases, 
The last one was completed in 2019. This facility now uh, receives 175,000 of cubic meters per day of this oily uh, contaminated um, uh, water. So this uh, nature-based solution is the largest SAS facility uh, in the world, the largest uh, facility that utilizes this uh, kind of natural technology. And it covers 5 million uh, square meters or 500 hectares of uh, wetland uh, systems. The process is relatively simple, relatively simple. So we, uh, the produced water comes from the oil company. Uh, there is a turnover point where uh, there is some metering, some uh, valves, there is an equalization basin for the inflow. Uh, some oil recovery also takes place using a passive uh, system, hydrocyclone. So, uh, recovery of the crude oil takes place here without the use of energy and the use of chemicals. So more than 85% of the residual hydrocarbons in the produced water is recovered at this point. Then the um, remaining water is discharged in the series of constructed wetlands with surface flow and the treated water is, uh, at least that was the initial design, is discharged through evaporation ponds. Of course, uh, uh, there are many, um, we did many investigations and it's always desired to find uh, other uh, possible uses of the treated effluent. I remind you that we are in the desert and in, in probably the most water scarce uh, uh, region uh, in the world. So this is a, an aerial view, an aerial picture of uh, the facility of this is the treatment uh, wetland cells and downstream you can see the evaporation ponds uh, where the treated water is discharged and through a series of channels and ponds, eventually it's evaporated and leads to the formation downstream of uh, industrial grade salt, which is then uh, reused and given to uh, industries because it's used as a catalyst. Um, these are some uh, pictures of um, the facility. So this is the intake point, the metering system, the hydrocyclones, uh, the oil separators, the passive system. And of course, there is always a bypass line. So once we have this uh, passive separation here, there is a, a buffer channel which is used exactly to um, uh, spread and disseminate and, uh, and load the wastewater with gravity to the uh, constructed wetlands. It is worth mentioning that no electricity, so no pumping uh, is used in the facility just by gravity flow uh, uh, the water passes from the upstream and which is the downstream uh, parts. To um, give you a better idea of the size of that facility, if we could express it uh, in terms of football field. So uh, this, the size, the surface area would equal, be equal to 1200 football fields. And this is a view of the downstream uh, ponds, evaporation ponds that have been constructed for the discharge of the treated airflow. So the first goal, uh, which was to replace um, the uh, deep well disposals with the wetland is um, then the uh, treatment performance. And of course the goal is to reach the very strict standard, which is uh, 0.5 ppm, so of total petroleum hydrocarbons in the outflow. So practically completely eliminate hydrocarbons. And as you can see in the, uh, in the graph, Along the system, this is achieved downstream at the final uh, outflow. But what is more impressive is environmental performance of this facility. So since this uh, facility is up and running, uh, more than five actually deep well disposal sites are shut down, which translates uh, to more than 99% reduction in the energy consumption uh, compared to the energy, the minimum practical energy that is used in this facility which also translates to the respective uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, more than 99%. So this is the first uh, um, uh, indicator that um, this, the adoption of these sustainable technologies, natural, natural nature-based solutions, it is actually very effective, not just in terms of treatment, but in terms of the whole environmental performance of the treatment process itself. So from this inflow, we go to this uh, outflow, a clear, a clean effluent. Uh, but what is more important is that by using such solutions now, we can develop a model on how we can 
a circular model on how we can manage the produce water for the oil and gas industry, which of course can be easily transferred and applied to other industrial uh, effluents as well. So the first is to replace the previous management strategy and the deep oil disposals with a nature-based solution. By this, we get the treated effluent, which also the clean water, which also in this case uh, is bright. So it has a relatively high salinity. So what can we do with this uh, uh, water? First is to, to, to go for an aquaculture development. So for streams development in order uh, <clears throat> to exploit further the, this treated water without any further intervention. The other is to go for biosaline agriculture. Biosaline meaning that we will irrigate some crops, plants, trees, which are salt tolerant. So uh, crops that can grow with uh, uh, the water that has these levels of uh, salinity. Or of course, we can go for something more traditional, more traditional approach through desalination, which can be uh, powered uh, uh, by a solar pump, so using renewable energy, and then go for a traditional agriculture, which in this case, in, in the region would be date pulps or even fodder grass. And of course, as you can see, all this uh, has the point that uh, we want to generate another stream of revenue uh, by doing these applications, either from the traditional agriculture or from the biosaline agriculture, where we irrigate, for example, uh, energy plants, biofuels, or wood, uh, biomass, trees. So all of these uh, um, have another market potential. And not just this, by uh, using the wetland uh, system, the wetland technology, uh, we also generate a real biomass. There is the biomass of there is. So what can also do with that? One option is to use it to produce compost on site which can then be reused uh, as, uh, to uh, amend the soil in the irrigation field where we irrigate with the treated water. Or we can use it to produce biogas to cover the small energy uh, needs for the operation of the whole uh, facility. And by doing so, as you can see different uh, steps, uh, we practically eliminate the CO2 the carbon emissions. And this means that we can also uh, generate carbon credits because we have set the emissions while we close um, the uh, material cycle and uh, we also contribute significantly to uh, water conservation. So this is a, a picture of the biosaline agricultural field, 220,000 square meters area, where different crops, different trees, uh, uh, plants were irrigated more than 15 different species with the treated effluent exactly to see which one of them, first of all, can survive in these conditions, irrigated with this water and under this uh, climate. Don't forget, we are in the desert. Uh, so these are some of the um, plants. Here is the cotton and the uh, cotton production, harvesting that was tested, some grasses, other grasses as well, and of course, different biofuels, different uh, plants, uh, energy plants, which can use to produce bio. Uh, fuels. And it's worth mentioning that by doing such research, um, the Nimanats a few years last ago, two years ago, to have the first commercial uh, flight of the Etihad Airways from Abu Dhabi to Amsterdam, where 50% of the fuel in that plane came from the production here of uh, biofuels. Uh, the compost trial was also carried out to identify what is the final a quality of the compost uh, that we get uh, using uh, this material. So it was confirmed that we can get a good quality compost that we can use, reuse them uh, in, uh, in the agricultural field. Another option that uh, is also interesting is to use this water for mangrove wetlands, uh, to develop mangrove wetlands. Why is this? Because as perhaps you know, uh, mangroves can sequester carbon up to 100 times faster than the terrestrial forests. And they have also the ability to store more than five times more carbon in their biomass. So uh, such projects are uh, lately applied and implemented exactly to, um, for carbon sequestration and to generate carbon uh, credits. So this was, this was also tested. And uh, another uh, parameter that was investigated is the ecosystem services that are provided by using such a nature-based solution. 
So we uh, monitor the temperature, the humidity, such parameters in the body, in the wetland body, inside the wetland body, but also in different uh, distances from the edge of the wetland up to one kilometer. So what we found, as you can see in the thermal uh, picture here, is that there is a perimeter of up to one uh, kilometer, more or less, with a temperature difference that could reach up to 10 degrees Celsius between uh, uh, the wetland bodies. So you can imagine what would be the effect of uh, using such uh, nature-based solutions in the peri-urban or urban area, and generally for the people who live and work uh, uh, nearby such uh, facilities and the effect that it will have, for example, in the microclimate and in the energy that will be needed for heating, for example. And another uh, nice uh, effect is that by having such a massive wetland system in the desert, green area, it is used by uh, migratory species that are using this facility for a stopover during their migration uh, trip. So to sum up, in the oil and gas industry and generally to manage this oily water, we need uh, the industry needs sustainable solutions. And this is what can be provided by using nature-based solutions. And this is already a proven concept with that can have a quite uh, um, a good performance, effective, and of course, cost uh, effective with a long operational life, a more or less simple, uh, non-technical uh, operation and maintenance need. Uh, zero either energy uh, uh, consumption chemicals or maybe very small amounts of energy is needed. And of course, it, pro it provides several environmental benefits such as carbon foot mitigation and increased resilience. And this is the kind of, co of uh, concept and approaches that we need in order to produce and generate and develop more circular uh, models generally in the industry, in the wastewater management. And here, in this particular example, you saw that reuse in agriculture, we use different byproducts, either uh, biomass or water in, in, in agriculture is uh, in focus. So overall, uh, this is a very good example that shows and demonstrates that nature-based solutions, um, it can be uh, a key, can play a key role for the transition to a circular water economy. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Alexandros, for uh, this ni nice presentation, proposing also some uh, some solutions uh, for, for wetlands and their uh, better use. For example, here at the JRC, we also trying to use Copernicus uh, or other ortho imagery for wetland um, mapping and characterization. So uh, I think, uh, and then if you add your um, sustainable technology, uh, it becomes even more uh, important. Uh, thank you um, for this. Um, we are a bit um, running out of time, but maybe we can have uh, uh, a couple of uh, comments or questions uh, to the speakers. I see that uh, Mr. Rossini uh, have a question to you, uh, Alexandros. Um, uh, how, how did you evaluate volatile organic compounds from the evaporation pond and uh, natural organic radioactive matter in the evaporated salt. Uh, so there's a question through uh, the chat. Can you uh, answer? Yeah, in this particular, we measure this. And uh, in this particular uh, produced waters, in this inflow, these levels are really high. Uh, the only, um, not radioactive, but the only element that was a little bit higher than normal was boron, which is, I think, more or less expected. But we also found some uh, simulation of, of this uh, heavy metal in the, uh, in the plant, in the reeds, uh, which kept it at levels below uh, what the threshold that is usually considered to be toxic or phytotoxic, because we are reusing uh, the water for these commercial plants. So in this particular case, we were below, um, uh, practically, we didn't have very low uh, uh, concentrations. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, maybe um, a, a comment, a question uh, to uh, Costanza. Uh, concerning the uh, microalgae uh, treatments. Mm, I saw one comment that uh, it's, of course, um, 
a very important topic uh, as far as nitrate contamination yeah. uh, is, uh, is concerned. And um, you are proposing some improvements uh, by, by your research, but do you have some comparison to other available methods? A comparison, uh, for example, as far as efficiency is concerned or environmental sustainability or performance? Uh, how, how would you place uh, your well, research? The, the depuration of nitrogen, in particular nitrate, for, uh, thanks to microalgae, is uh, for sure an interesting application. However, we could, uh, uh, it is possible to use microalgae to purify wastewaters that has uh, quite limited uh, uh, nitrate concentration because uh, the algae has, the algae has uh, um, should, uh, should grow in this, uh, in this kind of uh, um, wastewaters. Uh, so uh, usually microalgae are used for the purification of uh, wastewater that are not so enriched in, uh, in nitrogen, in nitrates. And uh, I'm not really a, 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 an answer to your question because uh, uh, traditional plant, uh, wastewater tr uh, treatment plants uh, uh, uses uh, other kinds of, uh, uh, of um, methods to purify to de for the, contam the, the contamination of uh, nitrates. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, precision. Um, maybe one or two comments. I see Marco is uh, overlooking us. Yeah. No, that, this, this does not mean that you have to close. Okay, I, okay. I already so can... told Piotr that he, uh, if there is an interesting discussion, I just finished the sustainathon and uh, it was crazy. Yes, yes. <laughs> Good, good, good. I, I made some publicity. I, of I will take a bottle of wine in, in, in one shot. Uh, I'll <laughs> be sure. <laughs> it was really crazy. Good, Please, uh, Piotr, I don't want to stop you. Continue the discussion. Yes, and, uh, uh, maybe another, another um, comment to uh, Mr. Rossini. Um, you showed that uh, the procedure of uh, engineering design and then permitting procedure is going ahead. So um, that was one of my questions, but I see now... Uh, it's uh, about to be solved, let's say, if everything goes fine with the... It, it's know. still ongoing. Superintendent. We, we, we get uh, last news uh, just this week, but uh, it's uh, very difficult to explain to stakeholders that mm -hmm. this plant uh, is something to improve the sustainability of the oil center in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is that uh, um, it's something new. That area is... Uh, um, quite uh, in, 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 in intensive uh, in used for industrial use. And the stakeholders uh, always uh, uh, try to reduce the industrial, mm -hmm. industrial impact. But uh, this plant uh, will be um, realized in a, an expansion for industrial area. And we also demonstrated that, that the environmental impact is very, very low and is uh, um, really low compared with uh, about more than 100 tank truck daily which go out from the oil center to the external um, plant for the disposal of the produced water as uh, liquid waste. Mm -hmm. So we, um, our aim is to uh, realize this plant close to the oil center and uh, obtain fresh water for industrial use. So also, uh, so we can reduce the mm, traffic from uh, EV, mm, EV, EV yes. trucks and yeah. also avoid to um, withdraw fresh water for other uh, civil and agriculture use. Uh, also, I, I mm, did that uh, question to Professor Alexander. I, I thank him for, for the really interesting um, in presentation. Uh, but in Italy, uh, the problem of uh, volatile of organic compound and the uh, really close uh, citizen to the to the plant. Uh, Cannot uh, be uh, cannot consent to us to realize a plant like that because an evaporation pond is very difficult to uh, be authorized in in that area. But uh, I, I I understand that this was a very uh, useful way to manage the produced water. 
thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the comment and uh, also uh, transmitting the uh, heart of the um, project and the problem. Um, so it was it was very interesting. Um, maybe another comment for uh, the next uh, speaker, Nazaria. Uh, I, I, I was, uh, let's say, uh, focused when you were um, speaking about the arsenic in soil, uh, that uh, in the third year it's increasing uh, again, uh, regardless uh, the arsenic content uh, in, the, in the sludge. Uh, do we have some more, more insights uh, on, on this? Uh, um, um, we can say that uh, uh, it seems uh, that uh, um, yeah, independently from uh, soil type uh, and uh, even uh, sludge uh, quantity applied uh, to the experimental fields, uh, the trend uh, was uh, the same for uh, all plots. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found uh, a similar attitude in an old study, uh, which was um, uh, which was uh, made in Emilia Romagna region many years ago. There, there is a sort of uh, cyclicity, okay, a trend that uh, had a Gaussian uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Gaussian uh, curve, but because uh, we have always an increasing and then a decreasing. And we think that it could be of uh, uh, three years, three, three, four years. And um, unfortunately, there are uh, uh, experimental fields of uh, 20 years uh, uh, of experience in Emilia-Romagna region in some uh, uh, experimental plots. But uh, as uh, the arsenic was included in the national legislation, they didn't uh, measure it, and so we haven't got the answer on the long term for the accumulation of arsenic. We have uh, just our study as far as arsenic in soil, but uh, it is uh, it is confirmed a cyclicity three four years and then. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for, for this. Um, uh, it's indeed a very pedagogical soil related view uh, on the matter. I work in, in soil. Uh, uh, <laughs> it is, uh, I think that the soil um, sometimes uh, is the, the part that it is missed in the evaluation of uh, sludge uh, spreading because uh, uh, frequently uh, people think about uh, water quality, underground water quality, and it is true, but uh, the sludge uh, firstly pass uh, through the soil. So we, yes. we have to understand better what happens in soil before the, the water arrives to the underground. Mm -hmm. So now soil will be uh, taken into account with the revision of the soil sludge directive because we are heavily involved uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. I know that there is a revision, mm -hmm. and um, it is a good thing, very good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Nazaria. Piotr, may I ask uh, what, what yes, a question yes. to Nazaria? Curiosity, very, very fast. Sorry, Piotr. Um, Nazaria, I, I've heard of uh, uh, a news, I don't know if it's true. Uh, for uh, is not allowed to spread the sewage sludge in the Parmigiano Reggiano production area. Is it true and which is the reason? Um, uh, normally it is not allowed to spread the seaway sludge on the alpha alpha uh, crops. Okay, and uh, of course uh, in Parmigiano Reggiano area, the alpha alpha crops are one of the main uh, cultivation. Uh, so perhaps uh, you have heard this association of, uh, <laughs> of uh, ideas, but uh, um, the fact is that for, um, for the seaway uh, spreading, there are uh, um, different sectors of the legislation because uh, in Emilia-Romagna region, but even in the national legislation, there is a difference between the uh, types of seaway sludge. So for example, the tomato canning industry sludges that are uh, the so-called agro-industrial sludges, uh, there is uh, um, less uh, extinctions because, uh, uh, because they, are, they have a high quality, environmental high quality, and because uh, they um, are produced only for a few months a year, because they are seasonal 
uh, working these uh, these uh, industries, and uh, uh, so far the sludges can be uh, applied in agriculture with a different uh, uh, with a different uh, uh, criteria according by law. But the, um, the, no, the industrial plant uh, seaway sludges cannot be applied on alpha alpha crops. Thank you, Nazario, very clear. Okay, thank you. I think that um, we don't have uh, any other questions. Uh, I also asked you, see, so um, we agreed um, to be to be closing uh, the the session. We are already a bit out of um, out of time, out of schedule. So I would like to um, thank you, Yusi, for uh, helping me um, uh, to to manage the session, and also thank you to all the presenters. Uh, all the presentations were very very clear. I appreciated listening to them, um, and thank you for uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, Marco, thank you for organizing it. I will thank leave you to the you. screen. Thank you. you. <laughs>